Good afternoon. My name is Saul Diamond, and I'm a, um, a professor here at Dartmouth in the engineering school. I have the great privilege of practicing mindfulness and studying engineering and being a, a researcher, uh, an entrepreneur, um, and a designer, and connecting so many uh, areas uh, in, in my work where I feel the, the mindfulness touches all of it. So being here with all of you today and experiencing the, the community and togetherness of, of um, shared practice, connecting the dots between all of your fields um, is deeply meaningful to me. <laughs> so the um, session that we are about to begin here We have a panel of um, three scholars. And whereas in the, the morning session, the scholars were all mindfulness practitioners who also study mindfulness in their science, the afternoon session here we have um, practitioners of mindfulness with all varying levels of experience who study many different things. So our first speaker is uh, Zane Thayer, an associate professor of anthropology here at Dartmouth. And we'll hear from Zane about her, her work. So I'm just gonna share one little anecdote of something about Zane that has inspired me in my life, which is that um, a year or so ago, I was organizing an interdisciplinary project, and I was studying all the, the, the backgrounds of different faculty here at Dartmouth, and I came across your, your work, Zane. <laughs> and I was inspired <laughs> by the, the breadth of your uh, the, the scholarship and how you're bringing it in to, to be impactful to society. So I, I invited you in to, to the project, and you, and you said no. <laughs> but it, it wasn't that you said no, it was how you said it made me feel like that was one of the best no's I'd received. <laughs> so I, I was inspired both by your work and by your, uh, your ability to set appropriate boundaries on what was within, within your capacity at the time and what was not. So thank you for doing that. <laughs> so, Zane. I'm sorry that I said no, but I'm glad that it was received <laughs> okay way. I am trying, I'm constantly trying to set better boundaries. I say yes too much. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, it's good to know that you can say no and it can be received well. So thank you for that. Hi, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to get to speak to you today. Um, I wanna thank the organizers for putting all this together. Um, Saul asked me before we started if I had a history of mindfulness. And I would say that, as you'll hear about in a few minutes, I've spent my entire career studying the effects of stress on health. <laughs> and through that work, I've come to realize that I can't just think about stress all the time and that we need to move past stress. And um, through that, I've kind of developed and, and learned about different methods for managing that. And so for me, that has influenced a sort of mindfulness practice, but it's really only ever been an individual sort of exploration. And so I've been very appreciative of this weekend because it's been the first time that I've been in a space where I've been able to experience a retreat like this and um, learn and 
experience mindfulness in a more collective manner, which I'll talk about as well. And so I should say that coming into this, I had been a good scientist and prepared a lot of beautiful slides. They were so pretty. Um, and then Saturday, we had our first day, and I was like, those are gone. <laughs> I don't want to talk about those. Um, I want to take this prompt that we were given quite seriously to think about our work and what this um, workshop um, you know, has brought up for us. And so I'm going off script <laughs> and just wanted to talk to you about it a little bit. So first of all, a question for everyone in this room. Please raise your hand if you've ever been stressed. <laughs> so stress is something that touches all of our lives. It's something that we're probably all familiar with as a concept. But I think it's worth thinking about what stress really is. And so as scientists, we think about a stressor, some sort of exposure, whether it's a physical exposure, like we go outside when it's very cold, right? Um, or maybe we're stressed about a talk that we have to give <laughs> or an upcoming exam. And so this stressor induces some sort of stress response within us, right? And this is a physiologic stress response that um, has actually been shaped by millions of years of evolution and is actually meant to serve an adaptive purpose, right? So when we feel stress, that, that physiologic response is meant to give us energy. So our bodies releasing glucose that our muscles can take up, our heart rate's increasing, our mental clarity is actually greater. And so this is meant to be an adaptive response to help us face some sort of challenge Right, that we're encountering in that moment. Now I want to invite you all to think about something that has stressed you out recently. Right? So go ahead and just for a moment think about some of the things that have caused you stress or worry. So as you thought about those things, how many of those things were actually stressors that you were experiencing in that acute moment? versus stressors that you are anticipating in the future, right? For how many of you was it that you were crossing a street and a car came, ah, <laughs> stress response, versus, ah, I have this deadline next week, or ah, I'm gonna have to have that conversation with that person. And so one of the unique things about humans is that the mere anticipation of stress is enough to activate our stress response. So it's not only that we're experiencing the stress response when we're facing an acute stressor, we're also activating that stress response all the time in anticipation of things that might happen in the future, right? We're not in the present, we're thinking about the future. And this means that what is meant to be an adaptive response, something that we're supposed to be using to help us face that challenge, is actually hurting our bodies, right? Because just as that stress response gives us these superpowers and energy to confront a stressor, that energy has to come from somewhere, right? And so the energy that's going to, to give us power in the moment is taking away energy from our immune function and taking energy away from our reproductive system and taking energy away from DNA repair. And so what happens is that when we're chronically stressed, when we're stressed all the time, we find that there's all of these physiological effects on our body. Our well-being is being adversely affected. We're experiencing digestive issues. We're experiencing depression. We're experiencing anxiety. We're having elevated blood pressure, cardiometabolic disease, infertility. So our chronic stress is really bad for us. That's lesson number one. The next thing I want you to think about is, OK, many of us know that stress is bad for us. But what not enough of us appreciate is that it's not only stress that we're experiencing right now. As it turns out, stress that we've experienced across our life course in early life, and even that experienced by our parents, can influence our health and well-being in later life. And this is a theme that came up a little bit over the weekend. And I wanted to talk to you about the ways in which this occurs. Because of course, when we think about inheritance from our parents, we often think about DNA. That's what we inherit from our parents. But as it turns out, there's a lot more to that. And so I'll introduce this concept by way of metaphor. So my husband is a baker. 
He makes bread. It's delicious. I try not to eat too much. And he has a recipe book that has all of his favorite recipes. He's an engineer. He's very precise. So he weighs all of his ingredients to make sure he's following the recipe exactly. But as careful and meticulous as he is in following that recipe, there's all sorts of factors that influence the way that bread actually comes out. Right? So in the wintertime, our house is cold, so his dough doesn't get a very good rise. He puts it in the living room where our wood stove is, now it's too much of a rise, <laughs> too fast. Right? So there's, there's how the temperature affects the rise. Then there's the oven. It took him forever to work out the perfect way to cook in our oven. You know, which, which um, shelf is it going to go on, and, and what's the right temperature, and how long does it actually take to cook in our oven? And then we go to a friend's house, and it's a totally different oven. <laughs> so even if you have the same recipe, the oven in which that bun is baked is going to influence its final form. And guess what? Humans were the same way, right? So we used to think that DNA was like the recipe. And if you follow the recipe, you get the outcome, you get the biology, you get the behavior. But as it turns out, the oven in which the bun is baked influences its final form, right? And so for this reason, a lot of my work is focused on pregnancy, because I'm really interested in thinking about how the intrauterine environment can influence our biology and health in later life. And so, we now know that there's a lot of ways in which your parents' experience influences your biology. This occurs through changes to your DNA that don't actually influence the specific nucleotides you inherit, but they influence the little chemicals that get attached to that DNA. Maybe you've heard of the epigenome, right? And so your parents' experiences, what they eat, if they smoke, if they experience stress, that can actually influence these little modifications to DNA that you inherit from your parents. Um, and so we've done a lot of work in this space looking at how things like parental stress or maternal depression or anxiety can actually influence biology in a lot of ways. So looking at influence on birth outcomes, how long gestation actually lasts, um, if you're more likely to be born preterm because your parents are very depressed or anxious. We see impacts on offspring stress physiology Right? So if parents are very stressed during pregnancy, then the children actually have differences in their stress physiology functioning themselves. There's variation we've shown and others have shown in response to telomere length, so actual indications of cellular or biological aging. So there's a lot of different studies I could talk to you about, but the point is it's not only about the stress you experience, but also that your parents might have experienced and really across your entire life course that influences your later life health. That said, just because you have experienced stress or trauma, just because your parents have experienced stress or trauma, does not mean that you are doomed to poor health. So something that we're really bad at, at scientists, is because we like a clean story, is expressing kind of nuance. And so when I'm talking about how people who experience adversity um, or trauma have worse health than someone who hasn't, what I'm talking about are group differences, right? I'm comparing group A that's experienced trauma with group B that hasn't and looking at differences between those two groups in terms of outcomes. Or I'm looking at the scatter plot, as was described earlier, right, where you've got a spectrum of exposure. And so people who have more exposures do worse than those who have less. But as was alluded to earlier, there's always scatter in terms of individual points, right? So there are some people who are doing better, right, than they, than they should be based on their exposure. So obviously not everyone who experiences adversity is doomed to poor outcomes. And that's something that when we're articulating this work, I think should really make clear. So why is it that some people do better than others, right? And Again, just because you're doing poorly, does that mean you're doomed to it? Absolutely not. And so this is where the point about what do we do about stress comes in. And this is where I've been really impacted um, by this weekend experience because, again, I've been thinking about these things for years, but all of these things that I've been thinking about, I saw present in the practice that we observed. And so the first thing I wanted to mention was thinking about movement. So we talked about the stress response. We talked about how the purpose of the stress response is to give you energy to respond to challenges. What do many of us do when we experience stress if we're not mindful? 
we're sitting on the couch, we're doom scrolling the news <laughs> or social media. We're just sitting and stewing in all of these stress hormones as they play pinball with all of our innards, right? But when we're engaging in movement, then that allows us to use that energy in a productive way. And so I so appreciate the movement that we practiced throughout the day, um, the walks that we did outside, because movement is so good <laughs> for helping you to, to balance out this, these, these stress response that we have going in us all the time. Another thing that I think is really important is the role of sociality and social support. So in any of the studies that I've done where I've looked at the influence of social support, we find that social support is such an important moderator of, of the effects of stress on health. In English, what this means is that you can be in a bad situation, but if you have good people who support you and are there for you, you can do a lot better. And so what really struck me about this weekend was how collective this practice was, how much people are working together to put it together, how much there's sharing in the Dharma circles, right, where you're hearing about other people's experiences, fostering that connection and being part of a community is so good for your well-being. We know this from so much research, and so it was really amazing to see that in practice this weekend. And the last thing I want to mention is going back to this idea of what is stress. So there's the stressor we're exposed to, there's the physiologic response that results, but in between that, there's this opportunity for appraisal, right? And thinking about what does that stressor actually mean? So acutely, we may experience that response, but can we actually take a moment to think about, wait, do I need to have this response? Okay, if there's a car coming and you step in front of it, that response is good, right? Again, the stress response can be helpful, but maybe we're feeling a response to something and we can actually try and be mindful and think about, well, do we need to have this stress response? Can I actually reappraise the situation and, and keep this from being so? And so the quick example I wanna use is when on Saturday we were doing our walking meditation and I was really cold. <laughs> I didn't have enough, like I didn't have a hat, I didn't have a heavy jacket. So I was feeling a bit cold and miserable. <laughs> and I thought, well, why do I feel, and it was making me a little stressed out, right? That I'm like a little bit cold and uncomfortable. I thought, well, why do I feel so, like, why am I getting a little stressed? It's because I feel cold, and so maybe in feeling cold, that's telling me that my body's threatened and I might be unwell, right? It's like dangerous to be too cold. But actually, I'm not in danger. We're walking. It's not that cold. We'll be inside soon. So I don't need to feel fear or stress associated with this sensation. This is a sensation, but I don't have to let that sensation make me scared. So actually, the sensation doesn't feel that bad, and it's fine. And I could think about something else. And so just as our overactive mind has the capacity to make us feel worse because we anticipate the future and bad things that can happen, we also have the ability, I think through practice, when I'm hearing, to quiet that overactive mind um, and therefore reduce that stress response and hopefully live more healthily. So thank you very much.